Welcome to Viewfinders. I'm your host, Graham Dargy, and today I'm talking with Craig Fraser, a commercial photographer from Northampton, England. Craig is the owner and lead photographer of Fraser Shot, a studio specializing in photography for business and brands. Craig's clients include Starbucks, Sodexo, Tottenham Hotspur FC, Nespresso, Tesco, Premier Inn, Marco Pierre White, Crockett and Jones, Northampton Saints Rugby Club, and many more brands you've heard of. In this conversation, Craig gave an amazing insight into the life of a high-end commercial photographer, and it was really interesting hearing how some photos that look simple can actually be some of the hardest to achieve. Our conversation covers Craig's beginnings, covering motorsport, hanging out with the back of a speeding Citroen Saxo, shooting James Bond's shoes, and why he always keeps a tampon in his camera bag. If that doesn't get your attention, then I don't know what will. Before we get into it, let me invite you to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star review. That is the best way you can help me to get the show in front of more listeners, and that's the kind of help I really, really appreciate. I'd love to connect with you, and you can find me on social media and at the Viewfinders webpage. Okay, go work out, walk the dog, wash the car or whatever it is you do when you're listening to your podcasts. Here's my conversation with Craig Fraser. Hi Craig, welcome to the show. Hi, hi Graham. Can you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your photography? Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, Craig Fraser and we started um, the current company Fraser Shot Studios would be now coming up to 14 years ago. So um yeah, it's been a, it's been a lot been a long fourteen years. Um, I'd say we are we are now fairly established, um, but we are unlike a lot of photographers. We are a, a team, so I guess we're kind of a bit like an agency in terms. Of it's not just myself. Um, we have about four photographers really trading under Fraser Shot, uh, and we we do a whole mix of work. Um, I'd say about sixty percent of our work is in hospitality, um, but we do a lot of product photography, um, corporate work. Uh, the mainstay of our business is, is B2B. Um, so we do a lot of um, corporate work for internal communications. Uh, and we do a lot of B2C as well, but probably a, maybe about 20% B2C, which is obviously the stuff you will see in the high street. So yeah, quite a, a broad range um, of what we do. We are, um, we've, we've moved studios a couple of times. So we're now in quite a big site, uh, 2,000 square feet. So we can offer, we've got a drive-in studio, we can do the bigger bigger items, plus we've got kitchens on site and, and things like that. So we have grown over the last 14 years mm-hmm. um, in, in Fraser Shot Studios, that is. Um, if I was to go back to how I got into photography, Graham, it would be um, I went down the usual channel of um, leaving school with <laughs> not a great education, if I'm honest, and, and I actually ended up doing photography as a, an, uh, like a night school. And I just absolutely loved it and fell in love with it and then went on to do um, an A-level and, and ended up going to university and doing the degree in photography as well, um, which just fueled my passion for photography, really. I think it's, you know, I often say to my own children, you know, when you find something you thoroughly enjoy doing, you tend to do well at it. And I think that was mm-hmm. definitely the case for me. I just, it was just something that felt right. Um, we did, uh, when I graduated, I started off working for a publication called emap that is um the, sort of a big um conglomerate, conglomerate company that actually runs like um a lot of car magazines um, like mcn you might know the motorbikes um and a lot of these kind of publications so i started doing the world superbikes after graduation um which was a, an interesting interesting part of my life you know i was not a, i didn't ride a bike myself but learning to shoot um, for a magazine, and this is in film days, by the way, this is uh, <laughs> pre-digital, uh, being on the side of a racetrack and, and not knowing what you, the hell you'd got on your film is uh, mm. would be alien to most people today. Um, but I think it, in doing that, you, you cut your teeth a little bit in, in yeah. photography, particularly with exposures and, you know, you going into a room and, and sort of knowing it's F8 at 125th or whatever mm. that is. These are kind of the things that I think, you know, that did me well, I guess, in those early days. But it was fascinating. You know, we used to finish a shoot and we'd hand off rolls of film to a, a guy on a motorcycle 
he would then race off into the city wherever we were mm -hmm. in the world and he would um get get them developed and then they'd find themselves on the editor's desk to, to select what they'd use so yeah it was quite an interesting start to my career being thrown in the deep end um mm -hmm. when you went to college and uni what kind of year was that so oh look now you're testing me so it would have been about 22 years ago when i went to university okay. um we went to derby university um now derby at the time had it was one of the top photography courses in the uk um because it had um some quite well-known photographers i guess in in that era quite old school quite traditional mm -hmm. um but it was you know and it was just where i kind of learned more about the the processes of photography and how to the technical side of it you know and how to use the cameras and shoot large format kind of i guess similar to actually what it is today so when you went finished finished that is that when you went to the magazine i did yes yeah. so i when i um graduated uh, it was a four-year course i had to do and then um yeah i knew somebody it's a lot you know this world that we live in in photography it's a lot of it is who you know um, it's very difficult to get into, as you'll be very aware. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was fortunate enough, a friend of mine, his, I think it was his mother at the time, was working at um, the, a publication and she just managed to get me a bit of experience. And, you know, you go in and you, you show them how keen you are. That's how it was done. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to, okay. this is all unpaid as well. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, just to get in, there's no money trading, but it was just an amazing experience to, to get out there and work with an actual photographer. And I often say to a lot of graduates we have come to our company now, you know, I think I learned more in the first two weeks there than I did in four years at university. And when you're finding your own way through it, like I did, it just takes, a, you're, you're just aware that if I'd, someone would be able to take me on a bit, it would really help. But yeah, it's a, so valuable to get that, um, just that experience from someone who's a bit further down the road, isn't it? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the chap that I learned with a guy called Howard Boylan, he's a quite a well-known photographer now. He does a lot of golf actually. Um, but I mean, he was, he was just phenomenal. You know, it's sort of, I remember we were at Brands Hatch, um, at the racetrack and, um, we had three motorbikes racing up towards me and I, and he just threw me in the back of his car. He had a little Citroen Saxo with the boot open and I was sat in there on the start finish straight just hanging out the boot, photographing these these bikes coming towards me as he was yelling out shutter speeds and apertures <laughs> from the driver's <laughs> seat. Um, but, you know, just just fascinating, you know, and how these guys got the shots. And, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just getting into these precarious situations a lot of the time that does make your shot better or yeah, make you stand yeah. out. I mean, it was fascinating. You know, all this is before I even used Photoshop or anything. It was like using the car, obviously, at speed to get the out of focus down the sides and the bikes yeah. pin sharp just little techniques like that I just yeah. i would never have crossed my mind to do that put it that way but it was like yeah. get in the back <laughs> that's that old school kind of field craft though isn't it that just can only come with experience absolutely yeah no, absolutely i mean it's you know it's really fascinating even now you know having graduates come into our studio and telling them little things you know that you'd think were quite obvious but I think there's a lot missed um, in the um, educational system with photography. Um, you know, I think they do concentrate a little bit too much on the old techniques of processing films and and things like that. When I think we've come a long way. Yeah, I think it's almost moving too quickly for um, for formal education to keep up with. I I would think most things at the moment. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, I do consult on the degree course here in Northampton for the. Um, they bring me in, I, I look at the syllabus and we, we discuss things. And um, I've been outvoted every time in trying to to um, have less time in the dark rooms. But I'm I'm thinking about these, these kids in there and them actually getting paid work when they come out. And although it's great to do these things, I would 100% minimise it personally just because it doesn't really bear much relevance in today's world. I mean, I'm not sure about yourself, Graham. When did you last shoot? A role of film you perhaps you perhaps do a lot i don't know but probably uh 10 years ago actually um yeah. and 
yeah, I would I would be curious to do it. I think it would be fun to do on the side. And, and it's, it's good for the kids to have done it, obviously, but you can't dwell on it. You know, that's not the world that they're living in. So Yeah, absolutely. I think it's good to do a little bit. I think it's, it's interesting. It's part of the heritage of what the industry we all love. I just would say there's more things you could be doing, you know, learning yeah. Capture One and, you know, things that we use, what I use on a day-to-day -day basis and probably well, I just couldn't do without, you know, so... And so from the motorsport, I saw on your bio, I think that you went into fashion and then portraiture. Um, so what was that journey like after, where did you go after the magazine? Yeah, so um, what became apparent quite quickly was that in order to work in motorsport, you have to love motorsport. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these these guys that I was working with loved their motorbikes and cars more than their wives. You know, it was, this is a real passion. And I just didn't, didn't really have that passion. So I, I just moved on and um moved into london and tried to sort of pick up on some fashion work and i i got a little bit here and there you know to cut a long story short that is a hugely oversaturated market and um everybody it turns out wanted to be a fashion photographer um and it, it just didn't quite work for me financially um so it was something i i didn't dwell on too far uh, too much longer and ended up moving back out of, of london up into uh, northamptonshire where I'm now based and started to think about um, setting up my own company and doing something. Well, actually, to be fair, go back a bit. I, I actually joined another company at that point and um, was kind of running that and uh, it became a director in that business and was doing more co uh, commercial work and didn't really touch fashion. I've done, we do a little bit of fashion here now and again, but it, I think it was, I was just kind of still finding what, what it was I wanted to do, you know, and the fashion world is um, it's not a very nice world. It's a very fake yeah. world. Um, I know a lot of fashion photographers and the lovely people and it's great, but it, I think you have to be a certain type of person to um, to really progress in that in that world. And I don't think it really suited my personality, if I'm honest. And so from there, how did you land on food and drink being a speciality? So in my the previous company I worked with, um, we did have a there was a client we had there who uh, was a big company and there was a, a lot of chefs there we were working with and I became quite friendly with a lot of the chefs and there was a big buyout of that company and when the company was bought out all these chefs went to loads of different businesses so we ended up working with lots of different companies in food rather than one and it kind of went from there really and it, a lot of it just started um, I was never particularly a foodie myself but I just built some really, really strong friendships with the chefs. Um, I'm not sure if you ever worked with chefs, but they are real salt of the earth type guys, you know, and they're just, you know, they, they, there's no theirs or graces. It is as it is. And I think when we talk about personality and going back to fashion, that worked for me. You know, mm -hmm. I've had a fairly modest upbringing. You know, my dad's a plumber. You know, my mum was worked at the hospital um, and I just feel like that the chefs, they were quite grounding and that they just, they suited me and I just loved working with them. And uh, it was, it's a real skill, you know, when you work with um, some of the top chefs and I've been fortunate, I've worked with some of the top chefs in the world. It's, it's just phenomenal, the passion that um, these characters put into their food and, you know, the, the love for the Provence of the, the ingredients um, the way they prep, the way the way they everything is spotless and clean. It's just I just found that industry fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I think I naturally then sort of geared towards that sector and struck up some good friendships with with chefs as well, um, which is kind of yeah, which is why I love. Food. And now I am a real foodie. I've, mm -hmm. I've got a, you know I've picked up so much from working with chefs over the last sort of twenty years that it's just been phenomenal. Yeah you must have picked up from the way that chefs work that you've described it sounds not too different from being a commercial photographer actually you've just got to know your stuff be very passionate about it and you have to produce something at you know seven o'clock on tuesday or whenever and it has to be to the standard do you, you think that sort of carries over i think that's a really good point graham i think um i don't think it's in my personal opinion i don't think it's good enough these days just to be a good photographer. Um, I meet lots of amazing photographers who who are far better than myself and can you know produce amazing work. I think the thing that is really difficult about our sector it's being able to turn that on when mm -hmm. you've got a client over your shoulder and they're 
demanding things which are, you know, you know, it's too bright or I don't like that, don't like this. Um, what about that bit? I can't see this. And I'm not sure about that now. We want it this way. And it's it becomes more as much it is about people management as it is about mm-hmm. the, the skill of photography. And it's for me, you know, I'd say it's always about how you deal with people. Um, it's, it's managing that relationship. And I think you're right. When you look at the chefs and, and how they work, they are, it's 100% what they're focused on is the food and producing the best. And that's kind of how we, we work with photography and how I, I do Certainly. I mean, I'm nervous before every shoot, even now today, you know, I have these nerves that it's because I want it to be as I want it to be a success. And it's, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, we all have as photographers in our mind, what we, what we think an image will come out like. And, you know, I guess when you hit gold is when it matches what's in your mind and it's rare that it does, <laughs> but if you can get close to it, then um, that's that's how I'd measure success on a photo shoot if I can get close to what I'm imagining it will look like. I get those nerves as well. I get quite nervous. I mean, I'm used to the rhythm of it, so I know that as soon as I pick up the camera, maybe it's the same for you. Those nerves will kind of go go away, but you get kind of charged up for the shoot, and you're thinking through troubleshooting everything every step of the way. And I get that with uh, photography tours as well. Uh, and that definitely resonates with me, and it's good to hear that that's how it still is when you're really at a very high level that that you are so um one thing i was curious about was uh, something you touched on i think with the people skills uh, was about uh, building your team because i know you've got a team of photographers and so on there and i think for a lot of people photography is a bit of a solitary kind of pursuit you know yes how do you find that working with the team and what does it give you? Presumably, you have to work with art directors and, and the client, as you said, over your shoulder as well. What does it add to you when you've got other people around you to bounce things off and so on? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think you have to let go of the notion as a photographer. What we do as a business, we have, so for instance, on a, on a standard food shoot we would have here at the studio, we'd probably have up to seven or eight people in for that one shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to kind of, let go a little bit which is part of you know it's so subjective what we do um as photographers we can guide people as to you know we want it to look great you know we want to shoot angles that are going to work and light things in a way but you have to let go a little bit you just have to in the world in this world and and let and listen to what people are saying to you um particularly the clients obviously um and it's i find i never i've never had an argument on set with anybody it's always been a process of taking on board, adjusting, you know, and sometimes things won't work and I'll, you know, and sometimes I'll just have to do them to prove that that's not the way to do that. Um, but with clients I've now worked for a long time, it's, there's a lot of trust involved. They just let me get on with it. But, you know, we, we will always have, you know, in our sector, people will say things for the sake of saying them a lot of the time, <laughs> you know, we'll all have clients who are, saying something completely random but you sometimes do have to act on it and you know so when i say about people management it's it does become about that and that's quite a hectic headspace to be in when you're still on a set shooting um you've got all these kind of things going on and factors going around your mind you're managing the people but you've got to get the photos right so it is a it's a very stressful environment to be in that i guess is why i get a little bit nervous sometimes because you know it's a lot riding on it you know the the expense of people to come up to the studios and bringing all these people together and chefs and food and all the costs you kind of you got it's all on you isn't it it's all on us that's what it's what we're paid to do i was just thinking you know photography um it's seen as it's always seen as a good thing to be a specialist in in the industry um but commercial reason I really enjoyed it maybe it's the same for you it's just the variety you could be doing a different thing every day um for the week but if I scroll down your well I scroll down your Instagram feed uh, when I was preparing for this and this is what it goes like um it goes shoes chefs food uh lifestyle sort of compositing thing to do with solar panels more food restaurant lifestyle gin furniture coffee cocktails Aston Martin light bulbs uh, a tannery, more food, lifestyle, bike shop, gin bottle, 
honey okay this is just a random chunk of your instagram feed <laughs> when you're shooting a different thing every day and it's got to be the same i don't know which of those you shot and which you didn't but you're involved and in charge of that so it's when it's the same person doing that what what's sort of the constant thing that you can take with you into each different thing um that kind of stops you from just being a scrambled mess <laughs> No, it's a really good point, Graham. And I think, um, I'll, I'll never forget it. I think early on in my career, I was always told, I think by older photographers, um, of you know, the older generation was that you must find a, a niche and do that niche and you'll become known for that niche. And that was the way to go. Um, I've just never seen it that way. And I've just... I'm, you know, we, we all see it every day, particularly now, you know, we're up against, there's a, a new generation of shooters, you know, who are shooting everything on very small cameras, often no lighting. It, there's, it, it's, it's very competitive out there. And I've always felt that I could shoot anything. I'm not saying I could shoot it as well as somebody who, who does that every day, but I just... I just did feel that we we could do anything. Um, it's like anything that if there was something I didn't know how to do, I would shoot it and learn how to do it before I had that shoot come in. Um, I was just that's just the way I felt. But when I hear you read them out like that, it's, it's kind of, it is kind of funny how 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 different it is. I mean, I think you've touched well on it. I think it is usually food, shoes, um, lifestyle, a lot of gin. Um, furniture it, it is a real array and i think that's that is exciting for us because um when when we grew the business it was just me and now we've, we've grown the business we need to service these people and i've got to, you know i've got to pay salaries um we've got to get more business in i just felt to to stereotype and pigeonhole us in one box would just be ludicrous mm -hmm. um so i think it's been a case of um the way we market the business you know, the, we never just say we do one thing. If you look at our website on frasershot.com, you'll see there's quite an array of work on there. And that's that was always in my mind that that's what I wanted people to think. Because a lot of companies will, you know, I even get it sometimes, even now I'll be working for a company for three or four years and I'll randomly speak to somebody there and they'll say, oh, you know, we were going to call you recently, but um, we know you do food. We've got another photographer coming in to do some headshots. And I'll be like, What? No, you know, and it's one of these people, you, you have to communicate these things. People, you can't take it for granted that people know what we do as photographers. We have to let them know. Um, so, yeah, it, things like that happen a lot, you know, whereas I shoot, I did five headshots yesterday morning um, for a client, you know, and it's, and I love doing it. It's different, but it's essentially, it's about lights. You know, I don't shoot much daylight. I shoot everything with strobes, Graham. So it's, um, the, the the lighting is the key for what I do personally. It's that's the craft, um, and it's you know it doesn't really matter if it's a shoe, if it's a chair, if it's a person. For me, I, I, some people might disagree with me, but I feel like the same principles apply personally. So you know that's why we've kind of always done a bit of everything. That really resonates with me. I like the idea of I I didn't I didn't like the idea of not being able to shoot something. You know, if someone came to me for headshots I wanted to be able to do that and I didn't want to have to say well I can't do vehicles whatever so um <laughs> there were some shots um on your feed of Manuka honey and the caption said it was a long day and a hard shoot I just wanted to get an insight into that because can you tell me about the kind of challenges you had on that shoot because anyone looking at the shots it looks really simple um, yeah. but in reality that's a, a tricky one and I think that really sums up commercial photography something that can be really tricky you have to just make it look quite effortless and can you yeah. tell me a bit about that particular shoot yeah no i think that's yeah that's quite an interesting one um it was a very difficult shoot um for yeah manuka honey uh i've shot i've actually i'd shot some honey before this shoot and i knew it was particularly difficult i don't know how much you got you know about honey but you get these like different factors so you get like i think it's plus up to a hundred of graded honey. Um, it might be wrong, it might be a thousand, but um, it becomes almost medicinal. Um, yeah. And if, when it comes really thick and pasty, um, with this particular honey, it was a thick honey. 
um, and we had to show that texture in the imagery. So we, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at them now and I'm cringing at how difficult that shoot was. Um, <laughs> In, in particular, the one where you've got the honey, um, the spindle, the stirrer, um, with the honey dripping off onto a, a, some blackberry, um, like a frangipan, I guess. And uh, that is all behind the set, if I could you know, explain it. There was, there's clamps holding everything in place. So the, 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 the clamps there, everything's set, it's lit. We've got about five lights on that particular set, actually relaying on all three images. And um, the, the pouring is the last thing. And then we, we literally poured, poured honey over the, um, the utensil and then we let, it, we let it drip forward. Now, everything's locked off there because, <clears throat> as you can imagine, I think we did about 40 takes on, on that particular shot. Mm. So um, rather than use 40 different tarts, we'd lock it off, we'd get the frame without anything in it, and then we'd look at a comp afterwards. Um, but it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was a very difficult shoot. And the, the main thing with that is it to make it look quite subtle and make it look like a soft, you know, uh, morning light. And that's, I think that's what's worked there is it doesn't, if you look at it, you perhaps wouldn't know it's been lit. I don't know if you'd agree with that. For me, I can know that that's been lit, but yeah, it looks like daylight, you know, but I think for anyone who's not in, in the business like that, that it just looks like it's in a kitchen, right? Exactly. And I think that was the kind of thing. So we've got, um, technically, we had to use some big diffusion screens. So we used like tracing paper, like a thick roll of trace um, in front of any light source because we want it all to be soft. Um, and even like the soft boxes, like you'll see, you know, like here, they, they don't cut the mustard sometimes. We have to put these rolls of trace even in front of those. And that's how you get that nice velvet soft light mm. across, the, across the product. But um, a lot of it's luck. You know, you can you can do these things. It could have been three, four hundred takes, um, mm. but it's but luckily you, you get things right and you see how things fall. And then it's it's all experimental. So it's what I'd call experimental photography. Um, but you've got to be set that if you do get it and it works, you've you know you've got the shot rather than miss it. So yeah, it's it's good, good fun. Yeah, it sounds like good fun actually. So you shot the kind of tart thing and then you put that aside and then you were just kind of dripping the honey over the the utensil exactly that yes so yeah we did um i think the actual to be fair the shot you can see on instagram actually was i think it was about the first shot i think it might have been the first shot which we ended, we ended up using but again these are very shot with clients who are obviously we're looking at producing not just one shot variation um and that's often the way with commercial shooting you know it's it's not good enough just to get one shot we have to shoot portrait landscape higher, lower with, with space for copy. And there's quite a lot of different parameters we have to shoot to, as you'll be aware. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what, I, what I post on Instagram are obviously nice cropped, finished images, but um, yeah, there's, it, it could be maybe a hundred shots from that one shoot, maybe finished shots potentially. Do you, do you find, I mean, I don't think you do because you're, you're experienced, but do you find that frustrating in any way that you have to shoot so many and discard so many to get to the one, or is that just the process? Um, yes, it is frustrating. I, I, I know that's going to be expected of me, so I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I think sometimes it can be really frustrating when you know you've got a lot to get done. You know, some of the shot lists we work with are, I often say, you know, it's all very well having a shot list, but please put it in, in order if you need them, because there's every chance we won't even get close. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of one of those things, you know, but it depends on the art director. Some art directors are very you know, happy to just get the shot and move on. And some will want to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. <laughs> you know, it's difficult. That, that's, pro that's probably where most of the tension comes on a photo shoot is between the, um, the art director potentially and the photographer is, is more just uh, the planning of the day. We can all get a bit lost sometimes and, you know, lose foresight into you've only got us for this one day or three days and we've got 20 shots to do or something. So... I'm always aware of that, but at the same time, you don't want to come across as as rude if you're in the middle of a shot. So it's, yeah, it's, it's usually, again, it goes back to that people management. Communication becomes so important from our side, I think, to, to because people want to just understand how long it can take to get that one shot, I guess. Yeah, and it's also very good to have people on a shoot so they, they tend to see that pretty quickly. If they've never mm. been on a shoot, that's a learning curve. Okay, moving on a bit here. What I love about your photography, let me say. It's a, it's a high standard, very high attention to detail, uh, creative, but understated and, and accessible. I think 
um, the photography or the lighting or the processing doesn't detract from the subject in any way. Uh, and it's, so it's clear that you've got a very high level of technical skills, um, camera, lighting knowledge, which we've touched on, a creative eye, but also big on organization as well, to, I think, to hold these pro big projects together. So um, let's touch on some technical camera stuff. Okay, so it's a bit of a quick fire gear round here. So um, okay. if you have a, a sort of go-to camera and lens combination. Uh, yes, I would say the majority of my work is shot on the phase one. Um, and it's usually an 80mm lens. I'd say that's the majority of my studio work. Um, but just to counteract that, the camera I absolutely love, and if I'm out and about, would be my Canon 1DX with a 50mm lens. Um, yeah, there you go. So with the phase, is that because uh, it's a medium format camera, isn't it? So yes, is the ET is the equivalent of fifty in the full frame camera? Yes. So I've got the IQ three. So yes, it is yeah essentially equivalent of fifty. Yeah. Okay. So that's your sort of standard lens. So those are I haven't used a medium format digital, but they're great big things to hold. I used to always use medium format with film. Um, it's a bit of a lump. <laughs> yeah. You you enjoy using that. I, I do. It, it's a, a more, um, it's a considered way of working. So with the medium format, it's a heavy camera, as you, if you just clearly stated. Um, but what it does, which I find fascinating, is it slows me down. Um, so when I shoot on medium format, I consider everything I'm doing much more. It's all a lot more measured. And it's more if I'm shooting, say, five shots a day or six shots a day for food or something. I find it a nicer way to shoot. Um, when I'm out on the, when I'm out and about, I just find that the phase one is just not productive enough in some situations. And you know what with the prime lenses now that you can get fantastic prime lenses on the 35 mil digitals, I, I just I, I find the job which suits which camera outfit, if you see what I mean. But I'll often have them both with me. I tend to have them both. Yeah. Okay, so you're not taking that to Brands Hatch. No. <laughs> I, no, I never shot that at Brown's Hatch, no. <laughs> and so um, I don't know if you use a, a tripod or if you've got one of those studio stand kind of things. Yes, I do. I have um, like a big Fober stand and I have a, um, oh, what's the name of the brand? Is it Gitso? The, um, it's like a carbon fiber, carbon fiber tripod, which I mount the, um, uh, the 35 mil on. And I have done the, the large medium format on as well. Talking about kit, have you seen one of these? That's the Arca, it's the Arca Swiss box. Okay, so is that just a tripod head equivalent for the stand? Yes, but you can take it out and about, and it is just a phenomenal piece of kit. I'd mm -hmm. say that's changed my photography no end um, in terms of movements, um, the axis movements, and how you can move the camera and get into position really quickly. Um, just a fantastic bit of kit um, and they retail at I think it's about 900 pounds plus the VAT um, but that in the, in a studio or on location is phenomenal I just thought I'd share that with you Graham because that that is forget all the really expensive cameras that <laughs> that's amazing so and that just allows you to easily position uh, tilt the camera and so on exactly that you know I've had a lot of tripods with you know you've got the, the turning handles and stuff and they're great but this thing is for fine tuning movement. Um, we shoot a lot into, I think I mentioned earlier about Capture One. So when I shoot for a lot of our clients, we shoot with something called the overlay facility. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but it's where a client will give us the a graphic of where the image is going. So it could be a poster mm -hmm. or a digital screen with all the graphics already laid on it. And we shoot directly into that sort of um, that file. So you can yeah. see placement. Um, and that's where the camera, the, the head comes in really handy because I can just make fine adjustments to give the right amount of space, for copy and everything else. So, yeah, mm. it's, it's a good bit of kit. That's a phenomenal way to be able to work where you can just, and then you can say, okay, we got it, we got it, let's move on. And you've hit the nail on the head there. It's it's that, that's why we do it and that's why it works because the client will, they, there's a lot of what ifs with photography and I go, oh, I think that'll work. But to show a client their image, in their finished document mm. on in location here, or we do it maybe remotely to get them to go, yes, that's it. We tag it and it will go straight into one of the guys here to start retouching, mm. job done. Yeah, it's, it really does speed things up. So that's the 
overlay facility in Capture One. I think it's a phenomenal bit of software. Yeah. Brilliant. So, well, I've, you've answered a few of my questions from that round, actually, because I was going to ask about whether it's a, quite a deliberate deliberate kind of way to shoot, which you've, you've said with regards to the camera and about tethering and so and about processing. So you do the processing yeah. yourself or do you sometimes send that to the client or the art agency? I, ha I will not. I refuse to let anybody do my processing personally. <laughs> um, it's a bit like um, and I think this is a thing for photographers. I won't ever give anybody a raw file or won't give them a file until I've, I'm happy with it. And I think that has to come from the photographer who shot it. So this is just the processing, the raw image I'm talking about once. So I would do all that processing myself, export the file to a high res TIFF, and then, then I'm happy for it to be um, retouched by one of our colleagues here. Yeah. But the, the processing is, it's so important of an image, just making sure the color balancing and sharpness and everything is as it should be. And then, then I'll let it go. Yeah. So um, just to go on to the organization and sort of creative side of things, when the uh, client and you come together, then will they have, um, I suppose it depends on the client. I, I know that's going to be the answer, but will they, they might have a quite a clear list of shots they want. If it's a restaurant or a chain, how much, um, how specific can that be? And I was wondering how much can you input into that as well? Um, and yeah, well, I'll leave yeah, it there. No, I think, no, I think I know where you're going with this, Graham. I think, um, yeah, a hundred percent. I think when I said to you earlier, we are, I feel like we're more of a photography agency in a way, because um, that's a part where we actually really like to get involved. So we do have clients who come to us and say, we want a shot of A, B, C, and D and this, 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 and this, and that, and that's fine. And, and we work with that, but we are often like to get involved in the process, um, of actually the shooting itself, um, and why we're shooting it and give our own expertise on another way of doing it. And we reference mm -hmm. work we've already done. So that's, that's where I think we, we actually look after a lot of productions ourselves. So, you know, we do, the location scouting, model sourcing, crop sourcing, mm. um, storyboarding, all that kind of stuff. We we actually manage that. So we take a bit of that off the client, actually, mm. which okay. is probably kind of answers your question a little bit. We we try and get involved. And maybe that's part of our USP. We we do we sort of push that a bit. So we push the mm. fact that, well, let's can we have a discussion about why we're doing this and see if we can give you some expertise. So yeah, that's quite mm. interesting. So that sort of creative side of the project, um, I guess there's a lot of the creative side of it, the ideas generation and the how the shots are going to look. That is that done before the shoot? Because I think sometimes we can think, oh, the photographer will come in and just to do something, you know, but actually, in, in fact, are you doing the creative before and then kind of joining the dots on the set? Yes, to a degree. I think what we do is um, mainly just because of time. We don't often have a lot of spare time because we've been quite busy. I know we're in different times at the moment what with COVID, but um, we will often look at examples or clients will show us things they've seen that they like. So it's a bit like, you know, Pinterest. I mean, we all know what Pinterest, is. you mm -hmm. know, you can spend hours and hours on that thing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But we do often get almost Pinterest boards that come through to us to, because I often say to clients, um, it's nice to know what you envisage. So for instance, if it's for, if you know, we do a lot of stuff for new websites and things like that, I want to see the website build mm. because that affects what the photography, how that will look. And so there's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of clients probably won't think of, um, which is where I think us as photographers, that's, that's kind of our thing really to think outside of just a finished image and start to look at well what will that image look like in their setting mm. uh, and that's the process i think we try and get more involved in is it's you know it's things like sizes as well particularly for web it's like you know we thought about which images are going to be your banner images and so they're going to be cropped like letter boxes so therefore we need to be aware of this when we're shooting mm. rather than shoot everything and then try and force and shoehorn it into a website mm. so that and that happens a lot so we we try and sort of make clients think about that a bit more, mm -hmm. which it's not necessarily something we can always bill for, but we'd add it in as extra added value on mm -hmm. what we bring in as a return, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, that brings us to a special round. And um, this is a round where 
um, I'm going to pick a shot of yours to to ask you about, which you can tell me the story behind, and then maybe you can pick one as well that was a particularly big or memorable moment or a fun shoot. And um, <clears throat> I've been working on the the name for this round, so work with me. I have to say it big, and then I'm going to put some echo on it afterwards. So the the ready the round is called double exposure. Anyway. Um, and I'll put some echo on. So very good, very good. Are you into it? I mean, I'm open to change it, but no, anyway. no, very good. It's yeah, I like it. Thanks. <laughs> Means <laughs> a lot. Um the one I really wanted to ask you about was um you've got some shots of shoes um which are a sort of tie into the new uh, 007 movie, which is coming out sometime. Yes. And um what I thought about these shots was I think it just sums up your work to me. It just kind of looks effortless and simple, but I know shooting something like that and getting it so immaculate is really, really, really difficult. Um, or it can be, you know? Um, and it's just a pair of shoes, so it's not necessarily that exciting, but you've got to make it look as good as it can. Obviously, for the client, it's, a, it's obviously a high-value kind of product as well. Um, what can you tell me, give us an insight into shooting that kind of thing? Okay, um, yeah, so shoes, um, I've been shooting for probably around about 10 years now, and it's fast, it's, I mean, I could, go, I could go on for a long time about shoes, but <laughs> essentially, um, so a, a lot of the work I do for the ones you're discussing, Crockett and Jones, you know, the James Bond shoe in particular retails at, I think, 850, you know, these are very high-end product, um, mm. all handmade in Northampton. I think it's about 150 processes, go, individual processes go into every shoe. Mm. Uh, and what you'll find with footwear, I um, it may, it may sound, sound bizarre, but I, they're, they're kind of like cars. So, and what I mean by that is, depending on the height of the camera and the angle you shoot them on, will actually show the last of the shoe. So they're all different shapes, the last. Mm. And um, if you're too high on them, they look too short and stubby. If you get low, you know, they elongate. So mm. I've been through quite a lot of conversations with the managing director of this company who's particularly, you know, pedantic about how his shoes should look. Mm. So I've kind of been schooled into, into the process. So I think the first thing with the shoes is angle, camera angle and camera positioning. Um, because like I said, they you know, these guys are very passionate about their products and they have to be shown in the right way. Mm. So once you've got angle right, then you're kind of set. The next thing is the lighting. So, and that's mm. why I refer it to cars because to show a shoe properly, I think you've got to show the beautiful lines of a shoe. Mm. Um, and there's no edge on a shoe, particularly around, around the sole, uh, sorry, around the, um, the instep as well. So you have to create that light yourself. So, mm. I'm often using uh, very long strip lights as an overhead shot, um, which are great, but then obviously they, they can then light the whole shoe. So I have mm. to, I'm creating masks to just put a very narrow beam of light on a shoe mm. and then using some, um, I'm often using just some little bouncers just to, to, to give them some form. Um, but you'll probably see at all the shoes I shoot, I've, I've now got a, a look and feel with the lighting. Um, and it's it's that is the key to, key to those things. Um, so that's the shoe, and then obviously the ones you're looking at sat in potentially on the in the DB5. Um, how do you get a light into a DB5? <laughs> uh, very difficult, you know. And there's, there's things going on here behind the scenes that are really difficult, you know. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm just squeezing small lights into small spaces. Um, really difficult, <laughs> but it's great that you, they do look very si you know, simple, like you say. Um, but yeah, it is quite complex to shoot those shoes. And I think these were shot at night as well, the James Bond ones. So it was dark outside as I was crammed into a DB5, <laughs> which is pretty small. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of a big lad as well. So I guess that's, a, it, you yeah. seem like it from on my screen anyway. It goes against me, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> I would be fine, I'd be fitting in there, no problem. It's a really interesting insight, and you sound like quite a specialist shoe photographer. And maybe we could do an entire episode about shoe photography one day. Yeah, um, no uh, was there was there a particular shoot that stands out in your memory as just a great, fun, good moment, turned your corner, took you to a different place, anything like that? Um, yeah, there's a lots of shoots like that. I think um, probably recently, 
uh, more recently, which was a, a really fun shoot, was um, I was commissioned to go to New York in, um, when was it now? Well, look, yeah, late last year. So about this time last year, actually. Mm. And that was um, really, really nice to do. I'd not been over to New York for a while. Um, and actually to be commissioned um, to shoot over there and to be given free license was pretty liberating. So mm. this was for um, the shoe client, actually. They've opened up a few stores in um, New York City and we went over to really, I guess, to document and get some street scenes and things like that, um, as well as, you know, some portraits. It was kind of ticked all the photography boxes, Graham, you know, it was portraits, some interiors, street mm. scenes. And um, I've worked with that client for 10 years now. And I guess that shows a good relationship when they've literally just gone, I need you to come out and do your thing. Mm. And that's what I did, you know, I had my camera and I roamed around and, and just freely shot in, in an amazing city and, and had free reign. So I think that that's one that will always stand out in my mind. Obviously, it's nice to travel, travel away, um, but it's not always easy. So again, logistically, just an absolute nightmare. You know, anything traveling after 9-11 has been mm -hmm. so difficult, you know, in terms of getting kit around the world. So that's... Um, that was, you know, it was challenging, but at the same time, I condensed all my kit. I travelled extremely lightly, and I was, I was really pleased with the body of work I got. So that, that was something that I've shot in the last year that probably stands out. And I think there is some images of, of New York actually on the on the Instagram feed, actually, yeah. um, that I shot a couple of street scenes. But, yeah, fascinating place and, and lovely lights. It's nice to shoot with different lights, you know. Mm. Um, New York's just crazy. Probably a bit like you up in Aberdeen. I mean, the light you get would be phenomenal and i've seen some of your shots in the early mornings and you know dusk and dawn i mean it's just fascinating the different kind of views you get from around the world yeah, yeah it's amazing it can be good year a lot of the time it's what i would call soft light as in completely overcast at this time of year up here i mean all over scotland but you just get this amazing light and it's low all day you know it's really good um okay that's really interesting and it's great that they've they've have a, a relationship like that with a client for such a long time that's that says something in itself so um okay another special round work with me here on the title it's a quick fire round and we're, okay. we're getting near the end um, i need to be quick then with my answers you mean i told okay. you i'd go on no, no not at all this is we're good this is how we do it and the, this round is called motor drive and that will sound better with echo it might not sound that good but still um, because it's quick fire, right? Do you see what I did there? I, I like what you did there. I do like that. It's like Very an old nice. school throwback to... Anyway. I'm ready. Okay. Wide angle or telephoto? Ooh, telephoto. Head or heart? Head. Uh -huh. uh, Beatles or Stones? Stones. Okay. Okay. What was the last great book, movie, series, album you experienced? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think probably Gamora. So if you've seen the um, the Italian Mafia series on Netflix, Knockout. I haven't seen that. I'll put a link <laughs> in the show notes. Okay. Expensive lens cloth or just the corner of your shirt? <laughs> corner of my shirt. Really? I'm, you've shocked me there. I thought you were all in for the high-end uh, cloth there. Um, <laughs> okay. What's a weird thing I can find in your camera bag or in your kit? Or in your studio? A tampon. Okay, follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> what the, why is the tampon in your bag? Okay, well, as a food photographer, believe it or not, a tampon put in the microwave and a bit of water for a minute and laid behind a fillet steak gives you the most beautiful steam you'll ever see in your life. I oh, see, okay. It makes sense now. <laughs> you look relieved. <laughs> the things that you learn, this is what I'm saying. I love having these chats um okay that is a weird thing i'm that was a great answer yeah i knew you'd like that favorite photographer right now oh favorite photographer it's a oh, good question david loftus uh david loftus so what kind of stuff is he shooting so he shoots um most people know him from doing all the jamie oliver books in the early days um but he's, he just shoots um beautiful food um Prime lens is um, travels very lightly now. Demands huge amounts of money. Um, he's rocking it, yeah. And he's, you know, and he's, yeah. What he does is beautiful, but he's he's got a real name for himself. And 
you know, he's he's smashing it out of the park. Yeah, big time. Yeah, good role model. Okay, what's one thing you bought? You thought it was a good idea, photography thing, but you've never ever used it. Oh, good one. Yes, I bought some triggers for my flash guns. They're still in the box. <laughs> <laughs> They were Calumet from Calumet triggers. I don't think Calumet exists anymore. And uh, I bought them thinking, oh, brilliant, I'm going to shoot with off-camera flash. I've never shot with off-camera flash now, as in the little flash guns, yeah. <laughs> and I had a, um, I've got a Quadra kit. Do you know Ellen Chrome Quadras? Yes. And uh, I took yeah. them out to do a job like last week, and they, they're dead. And I, I looked up the whole instructions and stuff, and you have to charge them like every three months. Of course, it's been locked down. Hasn't been charged for <laughs> seven, eight months. Or so those are dead. Anyway, oh, man. That um, is okay. my, yeah, I, I only shoot now on batteries. I've got rid of all my hardwired packs, mm. everything. I just shoot pro photo and it's everything's battery charged, you know. Okay. So and the B, um, B1, something like that. I've got, um, yeah, B1Xs, B1500s. And I, what was the one I bought recently? The, I got bought the small one, which was, I, can't, I forget the names of them. It's a very small one in a little box. Um, and, I, and I took, that's what I took to New York with me. Um, but I've got to say, I think I'd replace all my B1s with those little lights. Yeah. They are fantastic mm -hmm. and you can hold them. And, and you know, they, I know they're expensive pro photo, but I've been with pro photo for 14 years now and I've touched wood, never had a problem. Mm -hmm seems to have been a bit of a revolution the last couple of years and that kind of gear though with the size of it and the, the battery packs and stuff so it's getting much easier 100 percent. i mean it's just it's just amazing I, I can take a backpack with two two lights camera bag and a couple of stands and i've got a studio mm -hmm. there used to be a whole car full to, to do that and then you know you've got to lug it around but no kit is kit is my thing as you can probably see we've got loads of gadgets and toys and and stuff but i mean to be fair I've, I've always reinvested in the business so most of our profits go back on kids <laughs> um we just you know we just, we do use the best stuff and you know i i've you know i've had it when we've sort of made do and we've bodged stuff but with the clients we shoot with i just want i, I like to know everything works and is you know that's what I mean? And that's just the way I run the business. Yeah. Yeah. Last one in the quick fire round. When do you feel at peace with the universe? Well, when do I feel at peace with the universe? When I'm not at work. When I'm at home with my two children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think anyone running their own business, Graham, will know that unfortunately you lose a lot of time with the children. Um, you're not at home very often. So, you know, I really do savor their moments. Yeah. What have you got uh, kids wise? I've got one of each. Um, so I've got a, um, my daughter Darcy's seven and Oscar, my eldest is 10. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've, I've ticked that box, but, um, yeah, I'd like them to actually, one of them's pretty good, pretty good photographer. Actually I've been through COVID. I've been, that's all I can add. I think my, when we did the homeschooling, I was making things worse. So I ended up just teaching them how to use cameras. <laughs> so yeah, they're pretty good. They've got an eye for it. My, my little one likes to get the camera as well. She thinks she's like daddy. She's only four. And um, oh, we, got, we got one of those little kid toy ones. She was so chuffed with herself. Um, it's good times. Anyway. Um, oh, okay. That's amazing. That's so amazing. what's the future looking like for you? What's on your radar just now? So we are um, just launching a new business at the moment. So we're launching a new video company, um, which is in its infancy. We're actually, we've actually been subcontracting video work over the last three, four years. Um, and... I'm now bringing it in house. So we've um, started another company. We've got two new videographers joining us. And uh, that's the way um, we're not losing um, sight on the photography at all. It's just uh, that's that's the thing that, that we're sort of pushing in the future is more the video work. Okay. Um, it's, it's just it's a growing area. And um, particularly in COVID, we've been forced into it a little bit mm. because we've been doing a lot of online communications for some of our big clients. Um, and it's just the way things are going, isn't it? I think, again, going back to um, just saying we do one thing, a lot of our clients actually want us to do a bit of both now. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we, we, why give business away when we can sort of manage it and, and, and do it in-house? So that's that's what we're doing. But it is going to be difficult. It's going to be a tough, tough next six months, I think, Graham, just to 
see what happens with the world. But um, if we can get through this, then I'd like to think we're pretty bulletproof. Mm, good. Okay. Yeah. Where can people go to find out more about you, connect with your work? Um, I think the best thing is to go onto our Instagram, at Fraser Shot Photo, which is where we try and update. Um, the website, FraserShot.com, is a, is a good place to have a look as well, just to see more about what we do. Um, and the new business, which hopefully will be going live shortly, will be called Small Giants Media, which is um, going to be, because we are a small company doing big things in video at the minute. Cool. Craig, thanks so much. I've really enjoyed that. And it's a, it's brilliant to talk to sort of uh, kindred spirit. We're both coming from the same place, I think. And um, so thanks for your contribution. It's a really, really good insight into your line of work. So I'm sure people will get a lot out of this. Thanks a lot. It's been an absolute pleasure, Graham. Thanks ever so much. Thanks for inviting me on to your podcast. It's uh, wish you all the best with the rest of them. And I look forward to listening to some of your other ones as well. Thanks for listening. I hope you had a few takeaways from this episode. Follow Craig on Instagram and check out the Fraser Shot website. Links and links to some of the other things we spoke about, including Craig's gear and the James Bond shoes, are in the show notes. I'd love to connect with you. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and at the Viewfinders webpage, where you can get my free ebook, Three Steps to Better Photographs. Again, link below the show. If you enjoy the podcast, subscribe and leave a kind review. That helps the show reach more people. And while you're there, why not check out some more episodes? Okay, enjoy photography, be kind, I'll see you in the tampon aisle.